I'm here with Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura. It'll either be a very good event or probably a very bad event. You're used to Hikaru being 27, 50, 70, 80, etc. Frankly, I feel like if you were to remove Magus from the equation and I look at the top 10, I think anybody in the top 10 could win a tournament in a given a given week. Obviously, you, you love chess and you're... <laughs> Uh, I mean, I hope, right? Like, I <laughs> love chess. <laughs> we can start there. Do you love chess? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I mean, like, let's say just the activity. You love the game, and obviously, you're you're very, very good. Uh, what do you love in life, but you're not very good at? Oh, what do I love in love life? To do, oh, you know, I mean, I, I love tennis. I, I love tennis. I've watched a lot of tennis. I've, I took lessons for about eight years. Um, it's something that I love, but I'm not very good at it. And I think also, probably I would say the biggest thing for me about being really good at chess that has helped me in life is that when you're really good at something, I mean, I don't mean like good, but I mean like elite level, you realize how bad you are at other things and it's much easier to not be competitive. Um, so like, I'll, I'll give a fun story, but you know, when I was younger, like my family, we used to play Monopoly a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my brother, myself, my stepfather, my mom, and um, like my brother and I were generally okay, but my stepfather, uh, Snell, like w whenever things weren't going his way, he would get very, very angry over yeah. the game. Um, and he's obviously a good chess player. He's like, you know, he was 2300-ish around his peak. But because he wasn't like an elite level, I feel like that's one example of something that like he was too competitive about it. Like obviously it should just be fun anyway, but he was too competitive. And like for me, when I play like Monopoly, it's like, okay, it's just a game. It's something that's fun. I mean, same thing applies to tennis when I try to play where like I enjoy it, but because of how good I am at, at chess, like I realize that it's, it's kind of stupid because it, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. So you don't try to... You don't have like a diehard learner mentality. You have to learn. You have to obsess. Like you must get better if you're not good enough at something. It's just you're. More I, I mean, I, f I feel like if I if I do something, I want to get to a level where I understand what's happening in the game. But that's about it. Okay. Beyond beyond like understanding, I would say that that's that's good enough. But so for example, if I play a game like what's what's a good example? Um, you know, if I play something like Warcraft or one of these these ran random mm -hmm. games out there, and I just don't understand what's going on, I'm probably going to play it more because I want to understand it. Doesn't mean that I have aspirations of like doing anything further, but I want to understand what what's going on. As long as I understand it, that's good enough. Nice. You're not the first person to say tennis. I also like tennis a lot. <laughs> Ferruja, I, I feel like at this point we're gonna just get like a chess tennis thing. Like, the Pog <laughs> Champers came over to chess. We'll do like a like a singles or a doubles tennis. What's your tennis elo? I think I'm like a 800. That's what I say at tennis. I would guess. I mean, if if I'm hitting my serve well, probably like 1300. I would 1300 say around there. I have no serve, so I have no openings. Yeah, no, yeah, just yeah like, exactly. I'm like yeah, a Gotham yeah, sub. Yeah. I just bust yeah. out some moves, you know, and yes. I try to. Okay, 1300. That's that's pretty good though. I mean, that's like. Mm. With your forehand, backhand, who's the tennis inspiration? The inspiration? Um, it's funny because it's changed. When I was young, I really liked Nadal. Yeah. Um, but I've actually started hitting a one-handed backhand, so I'd have to say Federer these Federer. days. Because he's the only one who hits the one-handed yeah. backhand. There's, um, is it Dimitrov? There's a, there's a, there's a guy now who's, mm -hmm. who does a really good... Yeah, Dimitrov, but he's yeah. the only one. Everybody else is hitting a two-handed backhand, okay. so... Um, yeah, I mean, when I was young, I watched tennis a lot. I was a huge Nadal fan. But sort of, I would say, towards the end of the career, when it's when it was clear that both like Nadal and Federer were fading, I, I actually started rooting for Federer quite a bit, too. And it was, I remember I was in Riga, I think it was, uh, in a bar um, after I had this disastrous loss against Topolov. And I was watching the final um, when he played against Djokovic, the one where he had the two, uh, two match points on his serve. It was, I think... 40-15, and Djokovic won both and then went on to, to win that game and win that match. Um, but big fan of both of them. Well, you say, uh, you know, you, you, you talk a little bit about Djokovic. I, we, I, who is your, if you had to choose, your athletic, let's say, I don't want to say role model because obviously you're about the same age, but uh, the person you look up to, let's say, in the sports world, because I think at your peak, you're always in the conversation for best in the world, let's say, in Rapid and Blitz, and I mean... I, overall format i would say top three when mm -hmm. you're playing your yeah best, i mean so. my inspiration easily would be tiger woods no doubt okay. um when i was young like i also followed golf quite a lot and seeing him win all these tournaments easily easily my inspiration not even close specifically what mindset just the approach I mean, to the it's, game it's, it's everything but you know whether it's like the red shirt on sunday whether it's the fact that when he had the lead he never lost in the majors um like that's just kind of incredible and then you see all the people always wilt down the stretch like whenever he was in the running he always was winning um and yeah, I mean, it's cra crazy to watch him win all of that, but just seeing him win all the time, be so dominant. I mean, all those fist pumps, you know, all those those great putts, like that putt on what's like the 16th, that I forgot that 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 like double breaker putt. Um, of course, you guys don't don't get what I'm I, talking I, about. But, I literally know yeah. nothing about golf. It's no, actually it was, I think it was the 16th. It was, it was uh, I forgot which which event it was, but he hit this this putt and it was like this double breaker, or the chip of the Masters. Um, 
like all those amazing shots that you would never see from anybody else. Um, and just, just watching him win all the time when I was growing up was, I mean, easily the, the model for me. And I'm not a big fan of people who won all the time. Like I have to say that like I hated Michael Jordan because obviously I was a Knicks fan. Uh, I never really liked, uh, you know, those guys. Like even when I was young, I was not a big fan of Shaq or Kobe or MJ or any of those guys. Um, I was not a fan of Federer when he was winning in the early 2000s either. So, uh, yeah, I never really liked the guys for winning all the time. But Tiger was, was the one that I, I was a huge fan of. Oh, it's very funny. Yeah, no, it's tough. Uh, like when Golden State got their massive team a couple of years ago, it was uh, I really enjoyed watching Charles Barkley on television saying, we got to sit here the whole season pretending they're not going to win. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have used that quote sometimes, especially when Magnus is like, not in a field with you or not in a field with, let's say, Fabiano. It's, yeah, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit annoying. You mentioned Sunil, and I, I, I did want to ask you, obviously this is an interview about you, candidates, life, career, etc., but... Uh, I mean, I've known Sunil since I was, I don't know, six years old, like seven years old. I played in my, my first Hunter tournament in New York City, and Sunil was always there. I have a memory of, uh, of Sunil. I snuck into the cafeteria at a chess tournament. I started playing Bug House. <laughs> and Sunil and Bug House, the two-on-two -two chess no, tournament. You probably weren't allowed to play, or you weren't supposed to. Oh, no, right? of course, right? So, yeah, and so, Sunil walked in, and he was like, what are you guys doing? Like, it's about the tournament. He's like, and, and I, and, you know, we were just talking to Sunil, and Sunil said, uh, if you were my students and I saw you were playing Bug House, you know, I would throw the chessboard out, you know, and, and, and it just felt like, but this is my earliest memory of Sunil. I'm not saying it's a bad one. I'm just saying he, he has, has had such an impact on chess education. Can you just talk a little bit about how long he's been in the, in the game? Yeah, the so, I mean, I think when I look at the big picture now, there are so many people, um, I mean, around the world at this point, but just looking at the U.S. very specifically and in, in New York City, there's so many people who aren't living from teaching the game of chess. And... Uh, if you go back to like my stepfather as well as a few others, it was probably in like the late 1970s that chess programs began in various schools. He, of course, is well known for the program at Hunter, Hunter, Hunter Elementary, and Hunter College in Elementary, I think is the right order school. Um, and he started that program, I believe, in 19, I think it was like 1978, maybe it was like 1980, somewhere around there, you know, a long, long time ago. And that program has been thriving. I mean, they won many national championships over the years alongside Dalton, another school which did very well back in the old days. So uh, he's just been doing that for many, many years. And I feel like the early programs, Hunter and Dalton specifically, were very instrumental in proving that chess was very valuable as an educational tool. And it led to many other schools having chess programs, which led to more jobs, more people teaching chess, and people earning living through the game that was just not possible prior to that time period so i think uh his impact um it, it, it's funny because he'll he'll always be remembered as as a great coach who someone who started the program at hunter i think he's done so much for the game but like he like he, he actually i know when i talked to him like he wants to remember for some of his games not for not for the coaching and it's funny because like on some level for myself i feel the other way like i'll I want to be remembered more for all the content creation, this sort of stuff, and the impact that's had. And I'm probably going to end up being remembered more for my games. Um, so I think we both have that going. But, uh, yeah, it's just he, he's done so much. He's taught so many kids who became great at chess. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I'll probably be some form of his legacy in terms of, you know, how, how, how good of a coach he was. Uh, but I think the main thing is he always was very encouraging. He always understood how to get kids excited about chess. Um, uh, and that's that's something that's that's very impactful, I think, on on many people's lives. And so I, I think he's had made a great contribution to chess overall. I just had a huge brain blast. I played Sunil. Ah, you did. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the amateur team East, uh, my team was like a bunch of kids, and we were up against his team, and you know their average rating was twenty one ninety nine and a half. Uh huh. And I can't remember. I have, you know, like in memories you create situations when you think back sometimes. I think you were there. I think we played, and he was he was up a pawn in an endgame against me, and I held it. And you might have come after and showed him how to win. So you're playing on which board? I was board one for my team. Board one, okay. And this was, I don't know, 2008? <laughs> like, uh, maybe, maybe. I'm not and, sure. Uh, I'm not sure I was there, but that's, that sounds about right. And yeah, I'm just having uh, this huge brain blast. If it was not you, it was someone else. But somebody came over and was like, what are you doing? You like could have won. And uh, and I, I was just, I don't know, I was 12 probably. Uh -huh. uh, that was a big breaking out tournament. I was 12 in 1900, which is nothing yeah. nowadays. Yeah, but... I, that could have been me. I, I could have been there. Sound, sounds about right. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll have to check back and, yeah. and maybe you were playing in the tournament. Uh, but no, I, I mean, I know, I know Sunil's uh, contributions to chess have been just uh, amazing. And it is quite funny that he says he wants to be remembered for games, though, and you want the mm -hmm. opposite. Yeah, yeah. Um, young players in this candidates make up half the field if we go to around 20 years old as the cutoff. Mm -hmm. uh, not to make you feel old, you know, but Gukesh is 17. 
Yeah. Like <laughs> when you were 19, you were, I don't know, 26, 60, 26, 70. Like I, I don't mm-hmm. remember exactly, but Gukesh is the, the age uh, difference between you and the, and the youngest players quite a lot. But when you look at a field that's this young with players like Prague, Gukesh, Ali Reza, uh, do you, and I'm sorry to quote uh, Shaq, think like barbecue chicken alert? You know, are we, are we thinking like this is a 17 year old, he doesn't know what he's up against, but I have to be a little careful. I mean, I think it's quite the opposite. I think the fact that uh, I've played so many games online against kids who are even younger than him, who are phenomenal, uh, really makes me very practical about the whole situation. Like, I definitely view them as very, very strong. Uh, I think there's some some weaknesses, perhaps, in, in their game still because of the age they are, the the lack of experience they have. But I definitely don't assume that they're, they're weaker players. It's just, in this day and age, kids are getting so good so young. And honestly, I feel like when you look at someone like Gukesh now at 17 and the rating he's at, I feel like you're going to have kids who are like 14, 15 getting there in the future. I think chess is only getting younger. So uh, what, what I did at my age I thought was great, but it's only, chess only keeps progressing. And I think all these kids are only going to keep getting stronger and stronger. Well, speaking of, right, there was the story of Andy Woodward. Uh, and I don't know if you want to talk more about that or you're happy to sort of leave it as it is. We saw there was like one line in there that kind of said, you know, you sponsored some of his lessons. Mm-hmm. Was it any deeper than that? I mean, did you have some input on his games? Did you like, I am imagine you're not coaching him every day, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the way that originated was I played him in one of the Lee Chess qualifiers for the Fisher Random yeah. World Championship, uh, which I did win very critical because when I won that qualifier, I made it to the finals, which I won as well. Um, but I played him in a match in, in that qualifier. And I remember very clearly we were we were on a Zoom call, of course. And so like you could see, see your opponent. And one of the things that really stood out to me was that he was very young at the time. I think it was 11, maybe. Maybe 12 and there was very little emotion there was there's very sort of like reaction and the way he played i mean i did beat him in that match but he played quite well and that's something that i would say you don't really expect from a kid that age first of all because when they're playing someone who's so good at the game someone who's been around for so long you expect them to sort of like just be afraid make mistakes crack and, and lose games much more easily which we could I'm sure I'll talk about that if we go on to another topic as well. Um, But, like, you expect them to do something wrong. You expect them to lose the game. And then when that doesn't happen, um, like, it it really impressed me. And it just felt like he wasn't phased at all playing against me. And I I feel like if you look at a lot of these kids, the two players where you expect them to sort of fall apart and make mistakes are either Magus or myself, especially when it's online. And um, so I was just very impressed. And I was reading up about him. I saw the rating he was at. I saw he was close to GM. Um, and I also spoke to some other people I knew, and it was very clear that the financial situation um, that he's in, it's not, not, it's not great. Like, the family, they're doing all they can to support him to travel and play tournaments, but it's not something that's very easy, and there's sacrifices that have to be made. And so, uh, for me, um, I felt that at the time, the way that I could make the biggest impact was to try and help him get more lessons or to travel to tournaments if possible. Um, I, think, I think it was mostly just lessons that I was paying for, but I felt like that was the one thing I could do to contribute directly. And um, obviously I didn't have the time, but I did actually meet him uh, in Montreal last year during one of the tournaments he was playing in. So I did speak to him a little bit, um, talked a little bit about openings, not a whole lot, played a few blitz games. Um, so I have had some interaction um, and it's just, I'm very happy to see that he's, uh, that he's improving, that he has these opportunities. Cause I think, um, the, one of the most important things you can do is, is try to give back. And I think that a, a lot of top players actually sort of, I don't, I don't know if I want to say it's they have too much ego, but a lot of top players, they're sort of viewing it as they have all these secrets, they have all these things, and not mm-hmm. realizing that there is going to come a time when they're just not at the top anymore, and you should try to pass along, whether it's that knowledge or whether you've, you're doing very well financially, you should try to do things to further the game of chess itself. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy with Andy's progress. I mean, I, I'm not going to try and pretend to take credit for it in any way, but... Uh, he seems like a nice kid, and I think the future is very bright, and um, I, I, I hope that he can get to 2,700 one day. You know, I'm going to be the, uh, the old man uh, one day when he's the grandmaster and say, I mm-hmm. beat him when he was 11. Like, I had a mm-hmm. tournament in St. Louis, yes. and, uh, <laughs> but I, even in that game, I remember thinking, I got him, and I loosened up, and he kind of made a comeback, and then we had to play a super long end game, and I barely remember. I managed to win, but I had a bad feeling. And it's interesting because I played him in a tournament when he was the number two 11-year-old behind Ryo Chen. Who was like 23, 40 feet away, who I lost to in that tournament, and now Andy's a grandmaster, and uh, and I, I I don't know what actually what happened to Ryan. Maybe he's still 23, 50, 2400. But um, I'm glad you kind of touched on this a bit because that was sort of where I was headed. Is do you see yourself in a role like an Anand, where you're you know 50 and you're I mean you're like still a complete icon. You are like an inspiration for the 2500s trying to become super GMs and the young kids and playing simuls in the, in malls and everything. Or 
what do you see your future being when you're not competing as much? Yeah, I think it's very, it's very unlikely I'll do that. And it's not that I, I don't um, love chess, but I, I think I know my strengths and my weaknesses. And I'm definitely not someone who is a coach, first of all. Um, and then secondly, I don't think it's a role that I, I would want to do, even, even if I could focus on it. I mean, maybe working with top players is possible down the road. But uh, for me, I, it's just not, not where I see myself. I, I feel like if I can make uh, small contributions here or there, you know, frankly, I was going to say about the whole Andy Woodward thing as well. Like, I did not really make a big deal out of it. I think almost nobody knew about it at all yeah, until yeah. until he made GM and people. And then, like, I think in the interview, it was, it was brought up. Like, that's not sort of the the person that I want to be. Like, I feel like I'm in in the uh, I'm in the public eye right now. But after my time is done, like, I'll I'll go be like Barry Sanders or someone. Just like you won't hear hear about me ever again. <laughs> Wow, uh, who is uh, who's Barry Sanders? I don't. <laughs> well, I haven't heard about him. He did his job. I don't. <laughs> greatest running back of all time. No, oh, no, I'm I'm not big on NFL. I'm, oh, okay. This is my first year watching the NFL. Uh, I watched right. everything, and I'm okay. But so... do, you, do you know who Jim Brown was? Yes, more okay. vaguely. Though. Okay, yes. okay, okay, okay. That's that's acceptable. Then. Okay. I see. So he was really good, and now I mean, he was of... he was basically he he would have broken the record probably for for most rushing yards for a running back, but um, he also happened to play on the Detroit Lions. Okay, which I'm sure you're aware of are very bad teams. First, generally. yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally very bad yeah. for a long, long time, and he's not the only great player who like retired before he uh, before he had to. But he retired, I think, at like 36 or 37 before he broke the record, and he was just happy to like go and do his own thing, and. Um, so I kind of feel the same way that I'll probably always be involved with chess to some degree, but uh, sort of being in the public or being like this figure, that's not something that I really aspire to or I see myself doing, which I think probably runs contrary to what a lot of people assume just because uh, when you do have popularity as like a content creator, like you you are like kind of famous or, or celebrity, what, however you want to put it. Um, but while I mean, I enjoy it sometimes, it's it's not something that I want to have to deal with forever. Well, the next question will be slightly, you know, less uh, philosophical, I suppose. It's if you could eat a food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Eat a food for the rest. And you'll of never your get life. tired of it. Let's just never get tired of it. Um, that would probably be salmon. I would say. I mean, whether it's sushi or whether it's cooked, salmon is probably one thing. I think I could eat that every day forever. I was in California and I was with some some creators, and um, yeah, they they ate that like every meal almost. It was like <laughs> it was like a salmon salad. It was a sa not a salad, I don't know salad, whatever dish, but. Uh, it's like poke or something, probably. Like yes, it was some sort of poke. And I, I'm not a huge fish fan, but recently I've been trying sushi for the first time mm. ever. So do you have any sushi recommendations for me to uh, to try? Like basic. I'm like 200 sushi, ELO. So you're asking for like what kind of sushi? Yeah, like how do I get started? Like, first of all, you should see whether you like uh, sashimi or you like the nigiri, which are the rolls. The rolls. The, the rolls with like the rice or okay. whether just to eat the like the raw fish. That's okay. the first place to start. And then like if you like the rolls, it's much easier because there are a lot of... I mean, I, I I don't want to like sound like an elitist, but there are a lot of these like Americanized rolls, things that don't exist in Japan, like Philadelphia rolls, California or, rolls, or rolls. Like, California yeah, roll, yeah. of course, the most obvious yeah. one, obviously, but um, yeah, things like that. But that's that's sushi is good. Okay, amazing. Any last thoughts, uh, words for the for the people back home? This was like a pre candidates, but also just like a check in, like a long conversation. So any thoughts for the yeah? I mean. Home? I, I just think in general, uh, if there's one thing that I, I really wish is that uh, people would understand that like a lot of the stuff on the content creation side, that like everything, it's it's based on something. It's not like things aren't made up just for the sake of quote unquote content. Um, and I feel like if people had better understanding of these things, it would, it would make life a lot easier just, just for everybody. And that's not, not really something like that, that can be changed, but I think in general, a lot of people just misunderstand, throw around words and, and things like this, clickbait, otherwise these things. And yes, Sorry. to some degree they're, they're, well, I wasn't actually referring to you. No, no, no I, I, I don't, I, yeah, I just have all. dramatic titles. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't actually referring to yeah. that whatsoever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think a lot of people, it's just like, you know, for the sake of content, quote unquote, or things like this. Um, and the reality is, is the content you make, like you need people to come back just because you, you say something sensational and they watch one video. That's not enough to survive for the rest of your life. And I think people would do well to remember such things as far as it goes. So like, you know, when people say things, when they do things, like it's not, it's not just one offs. It's not based on like just saying something sensational for the sake of making something up. You heard it from the man himself, Hikaru. Yeah. Appreciate it very much. Sure, no Appreciate problem. the chat. Yeah. Best of luck in the event. Yeah, thanks.